Sunnylands will become a place where leaders of the world, uh, whether it's in government or in philanthropy or the arts or education, will be able to come to make contributions and arrive at accords to make this a better planet. You've got a new building to do it. Right, that's, that's <laughs> the first thing that we install. Uh, I want to welcome everybody to uh, this really very, very interesting event. And these are the opportunities that are so wonderful about the Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism because you have uh, the occasion to uh, get insights into really, really important things that are both theoretically and conceptually and academically interesting as well as being very, very practical. Um, and so my uh, only job uh, right now is to say uh, maybe two quick things. One is welcome to the Annenberg School. We are uh, deeply, deeply, deeply committed to the study of communication and journalism and public relations in China. It's one of our top priorities. Um, I'm pleased to say we have something like five or six Mandarin speakers um, on our faculty. Uh, the second point I want to make is I, I really want to thank uh, Jeff Callen, my predecessor and the head of the Sunnylands um, uh, Foundation, to, for having organized this along with, with his colleagues. But I want to point to one quick issue uh, that is a little startling, which is that the background of this meeting, and perhaps one of the reasons that Mr. Xi and uh, President Xi and President uh, Obama wanted to do this, is that if you look at the recent polls about trust between the United States and China, you see that trust is, along many dimensions, diminishing. More trade, more diplomatic relations, and trust is diminishing. So one of the things that Jeff Callan and I have talked about along with Clay and uh, uh, Jay Wong is uh, working more on issues of soft power and public diplomacy, as well as uh, uh, bilateral governmental diplomacy. Um, because it may be that the traditional bilateral diplomacy isn't working. Because if it were working, then the numbers would indicate growing trust between the two countries. And so one of the things that I think that the Anniversary School will be doing with our Binational Commission on Trust Building um, is trying to figure out what we can do uh, in the An broader Annenberg family to make those numbers turn around, to develop more trust. And certainly um, this kind of activity is hugely important. Um, it made a great breakthrough, and I know we're going to uh, be very interested in hearing what Jeff Cowan and, and his colleagues have to say about what really went on behind the scenes uh, up there, or over there in the desert. So with that, let me turn the floor over. Well, first I'm going to look uh, surreptitiously at Jeff Bob, who will give me stage direction. <laughs> in the absence of that, I will introduce Jeffrey Cowan the president of the Edinburgh Sunnyland Center. Thank you, Ernie. And I must say, <laughs> that the, the extent to which USC and the Annenberg School are involved with China uh, is, is really breathtaking. And, and it's only increasing, and it's very exciting. And I think at USC we have, how many, over 2,000 Chinese students here? More than 2,500 from the mainland. Yeah. If you add in everybody else, well over 3,000. Yeah, I mean, it's really, it's, it's really terrific. And, and some of them are here in the room. And actually, I hope as the conversation goes on, they'll become part of this, of this conversation. And, and one thing before I make a couple of opening comments of my own, um, I think that that study that, uh, that, you, that the dean just pointed to underlined the reason for this meeting. Uh, both countries realized that when there is a dominant power in the world, historically, when there's been a dominant power in the world, and a second power has come along to challenge them. There are centrifugal forces that often pull them apart and lead to conflicts, often military conflicts, which are bad for everyone. And so these two uh, leaders realized that it was important for them to get together to build a relationship 
that could maybe make it less likely that that sort of thing would happen. So the real purpose of this uh, summit was to build a relationship between the two of them that would be strong enough to withstand those natural forces that might lead otherwise to something that wouldn't be so pleasant. I want to say, just as a, as a background here, a couple of things that are, that are relevant to, to USC and to our study here. First of all, for me, and I'll be personal here, this is not something that became part of the summit at all. This was a surreal experience. And the reason is that there were four overlapping activities that had an impact. The first is that June 4th through 6th were the dates in which this took place, uh, June 4th through 6th were the dates when a play that I wrote called Top Secret, The Battle for the Pentagon Papers, which is a, pay, a play about the importance of free speech and independent judiciary and a free press, was going to China for the second time. And those dates, 4th, 5th, and 6th, it was at the Egg Theater, the National Theater of China. You can see it here. It was in Beijing on the 4th, 5th, and 6th, the 4th being the 24th anniversary of Tiananmen, this play about free speech and independent judiciary. So on the, on the 4th, the first day that it was in China, that my play was in China, this was happening. On the 6th, the last day that it was in China, I was privileged to be at the airport in Ontario to receive the president of China, actually, at Ontario Airport as he arrived a day early for the retreat that he was about to have, for the summit that we're about to have. Um, so, and then the summit, which we're going to talk about, was this surreal thing. to have anything to do with the summit. But while the summit was taking place, the Edward Snowden revelations also came to light. And this became an issue, obviously, on the international stage. But to me, it was fascinating, because my play, which many of you have been involved with in one way or another, my play then was reviewed in the Chinese press against the backdrop of what did it say, what did it teach us about issues of, uh, of free press, of cybersecurity, et cetera. So kind of a fascinating moment for me. Just to, Clay Doobie and his team are going to talk about a number of things having to do with the play. But I want to say, because this is a journalism forum, and Michael, thank you for for inviting us to be part of your journalism forum. I am Michael Parks, the Journalism School. Uh, I want to say, talk about three things having to do with journalism. The first is that in all of the reports leading up to this, I think it's fair to say that there were three players. And I don't know of any summit in which that's ever happened before. There were the two leaders, but there were Sunnylands. <laughs> we were actually a part of the news stories, and it was quite extraordinary to the point that actually Sunnylands itself was pictured on the front page of the New York Times before the summit ever took place, as well as the front page of other papers all around the country, as well as being in news reports. Usually a place becomes known later for the event that took place. We became a third player. Why? Because of the informality that it turned out that became possible at Sunnylands, which allowed for this shirt sleeves diplomacy concept, which, uh, uh, which I think Clay will talk about. But that press coverage of Sunnylands as a third player was very interesting to us and very important, I think, uh, to us as an institution, but I hope important to the event itself. The coverage of the event was terrific in the news media, and maybe we'll talk about that some. But I thought I would highlight two stories which were not so great because I think it's quite interesting. One is this story in the New York Times by Jane Perlitz, who's a great New York Times reporter. But in her story, she says, and we're going to highlight these words, their wives, Michelle Obama and, and Madame Pong, will also be there. And a pers uh, person familiar with the planning said that the leaders would have plenty of time to talk informally, undistracted by the constant motion in public scrutiny of meetings in Washington. Their wives, Michelle Obama, was going to be there. No, she was never going to be there. But the fact that the New York Times had run a story saying she was going to be there all of a sudden created an issue. Why isn't she coming? Why did she decide not to come? 
She was never coming. When this story appeared, it became an issue for us because at Sunnylands, as the host of this thing, we would have had to be hosting Michelle Obama. So we, of course, immediately checked with the White House and said, has anything changed? No, she's not coming. She was never coming. The reason Madame Pong was coming was because there was a state visit the Chinese delegation had had mm -hmm. throughout Central America and Mexico. So she was with the delegation. Michelle Obama was never coming. But a big issue became, oh, why has Michelle Obama decided not to come? That's an interesting story about journalism, because the New York Times, great paper, terrific reporter, Jane Perlitz, was wrong. How she got the story, I don't know. But it was never true, and it was wrong. And as far as I know, the Chinese didn't want Michelle Obama to be there either, because this was a story about the presidents. This was a chance for the presidents to build a relationship of their own. And the second story was that as wonderful as the news accounts were, and, and continue to be, at least one news account, in an effort, I think, to put this into a, another narrative, was the story by Peter Baker in the New York Times, which was a story about the chilliness between the relationship between President Putin and President Obama. But in that New York Times story, he said, he suggested that there had been a chilly relationship that took place at Sunnylands itself. Not true. As far as I know, from all the accounts, and we've gotten accounts from a lot of different players in this, but there may be people in the room who know other things, the relationship the two, that these two leaders built was actually a good, a good one that I think will be important moving forward. The last point I would make is because we are the Annenberg School for uh, Communication and Journalism, which is interested in popular culture, was that this meeting became part of popular culture. So wait, wait, don't tell me, for example, for <laughs> some of you listening to all, we were suddenly became part of that. Um, the Economist, many of you saw that cover story, which was a Brokeback Mountain uh, riff. Uh, and I think as part of, Pl of Clay's presentation, he'll show you a cartoon version of this relationship where, the, where uh, there's a, a picture of the two leaders and of, uh, of Tigger and Winnie the Pooh, which made its own kind of a statement and made a statement to the Chinese. But it's an interesting thing for us, I think, in School of Communication and Journalism to be interested in how this was covered also, how it became part of popular culture. Uh, we're so lucky at the Annenberg School, and not just lucky, it's, it's the foresight really of our dean uh, and, and the terrific work that the university and Clayton Doobie have done to have the US-China Institute as part of the Annenberg School. And so we invited uh, Clay to come out and be an observer and, and stand in wherever he could in terms of the, uh, of the event itself. And, and, so, and also, we wanted Clay and his team, and here's where Archie will become part of this, to see what the Chinese media was saying. We were reading the American media, and to see what the Chinese media was saying in Mandarin, not just what was being said in English, because it could be very different. And to, be seeing, to see what was being said on Weibao, not just what was being said on Facebook. So uh, we thought that for today's discussion, it would really be a special treat to have Clayton Doobie and Archie Lee. Please join me in welcoming Clay. Uh, thank you. We're in short, shirt sleeves, just as they were at Sunnylands. Uh, when Jeff mentioned standing in at Sunnylands, that meant standing in 114 degree heat. And it's important to impress upon you uh, that that was part of the context. Of course, uh, you know, it tested the air conditioning systems and things like that uh, for the good folks at Sunnylands, but it also tested all of those who went, including those who went to have their say. They were not invited to the party, but they went and had their say too. We have some things to talk about here. Uh, you folks have a bit of an advantage over me in that you can see uh, this, so I'll stand a little bit to the side and take a look. And so the first thing, of course, was this name, Annenberg, Anna Boga, and then Sunnylands, the Yangguan Zhuangyuan, entered the Chinese language in a big way. And that's something that really came out of this. And you, could, you can still follow this. These names will remain. Now, one of the talking heads after the event was this one the famous Harvard University professor, Joseph Nye. And he argued this was the most important meeting 
of two national leaders since Mao and Nixon met in February of 1972. That's a pretty big claim. More than 40 years, and these two got together. Why? Well, we'll talk about that. But if you want to go back and see what happened 41 years ago, we have a documentary that facilitates that, that focuses on press coverage of that historic meeting. The Assignment China project that my colleague Mike Shinoy, other colleagues Craig Steubing, and others have been part of. These famous handshakes. No shirt sleeves. No shirt sleeves. Very structured. And so if you watch the Assignment China documentary, you'll see, for example, American officials saying, we carefully planned everything that we could. And so Nixon comes down the stairs with his hand outstretched. And all of this kind of thing. Now, TV Guide, I chose to put this in because, of course, that's a good source of the Annenberg fortune that made Sunnylands possible, okay, was and the publication. School. And this school. So we acknowledge this, but also to stress that for Nixon and his folks, it was about television. It was about television. It was about the ceremony. That's what they wanted to project back. If they had had their way, there wouldn't have been any press, any print reporters, just TV camera people, right? Because they were focusing on the image. And this is from the People's Daily, emphasizing these things too. And so take a look at this website. You'll have a chance to watch the documentaries with or without Chinese subtitles. And you can also see there are some ancillary materials, uh, for example, uh, Dwight Chapin telling his colleagues they needed all to learn chopsticks uh, at the White House, and so they sent chops to, a pair of chopsticks to everybody, <laughs> that kind of thing. So, again, Assignment China, one of our projects. Now, uh, Dean Wilson mentioned the centrality of this relationship. So why does Joseph Nye say this is so important? Because the U.S. and China matter. Here are five quick charts to illustrate how we matter. These two countries matter. In GDP, you're looking at what? 34% of world GDP. One out of four people on this planet lives in China or in the United States. Two important ways that these two countries matter. How about global trade? One out of, one out of four shares of whatever's being exchanged involves the United States and China. How about global defense spending? Well, the blue here, the US, far dwarfs the Chinese side. But if you add these two together, the two countries are responsible for a staggering 48% of world defense spending. What our two countries do matters. That's why Nye is saying this is an important meeting. And a lot of what we do isn't so good for the world. And that would include carbon emissions, where 44% of global carbon emissions comes from our two countries. And so this is why this meeting, this relationship, so matters. All right? Now, Dean Wilson also mentioned that our relationship, uh, in some ways, is very good. Look how much business we're doing with each other. But the perception of that relationship is that things aren't going so well. And so if you look, this is a Pew Research Center poll done over a number of years. You can see that Americans, beginning actually in 2010, turned much more negative towards China. Now a majority of Americans have a negative view towards China. Uh, you can see from the red line that the Chinese have had a negative view of the United States for quite some time, but that it is spiking up. What's going on? And that's why it's important to have these discussions. Here, if you ask the two peoples, Chinese and Americans, uh, is China good for the world? Is America's influence good? The answer from the two peoples now, a majority of people say no. And you can see it's almost 70% on the Chinese side 
feeling that the American role in the world is a negative one. So this relationship matters. That's why this meeting was so important. Now, this chart hints at another important point. Now, this data comes from the BBC PIPA surveys over a number of years. But what I'd like to draw your attention to is that Americans looking at China and Chinese looking at America, only roughly 37, 38% of our two peoples have a favorable attitude towards each other. Each of us is more negative towards the other than the world is towards either of us. So we are very focused on each other, the United States and China. This is a very important point. Now, what else do I want to draw your attention to? I'd like to draw your attention to the gap between how Chinese see China and how Americans do and how other people around the world do and to the gap between how Americans see China or I'm sorry, how Americans see the United States and how Chinese see the United States. Americans have a more favorable view towards their country than do the Chinese. But Chinese have an overwhelmingly positive view towards their own country. And so when something happens in the relationship, a demonstration, a speech, something like that, on the Chinese side, the reaction tends to be larger because the Chinese view of themselves is much more positive than Americans' view of themselves. Why is this? Well, part of it is Chinese know China better. They're more optimistic. They're more impressed with how China's changed. And part of it is because the media tells them every day just that story and doesn't emphasize the negative. Whereas in the New York Times and elsewhere, we get the negative. So this is useful context for understanding how journalists and the people they are trying to reach understand what happened in June out in the desert. So Jeff mentioned, for example, the immediate way that Sunnylands became a player. They were going to a place. They weren't just going to meet in some nondescript office building somewhere in one of the two capitals. Where were they going? And so from the very beginning, so up here we have the announcement, this thing is going to happen. There's going, we have the Foreign Affairs Ministry announcing this. And then right away, Xinhua is there with an exploration of sunny lands to tell people about this. And Baidu has a Wikipedia-like encyclopedia with more details, including plenty of Google satellite shots of sunny lands. <laughs> okay? So it became. Now, my colleague, Archie, who graduated from Annenberg just this last spring uh, and had to get special permission to be here from her new boss, she started digging things up, and she'll speak in just a minute, but these are some of the first posts to Weibo, to this microblogging platform that is so hugely popular in China. And so the first one is actually from the American government. <laughs> it's important to recognize this is the Chengdu consulate saying our leaders are getting together. And then we have this, which is from Weibo itself, from the, the company, Xina itself, talking about they're going to be meeting at the Annenberg Estate, which seems to be called uh, this uh, village or countryside of sunny lands. Okay, and they talk about this. And then you have later ordinary folks starting to talk about what is going to be discussed, including that pesky China-Japanese relationship and the island disputes, these kinds of things. Well, in uh, Western publications, Sunny Lands became the feature. Uh, Jeff mentioned uh, the New York Times, but Time Magazine went crazy. Time Magazine published a bunch of photos to tell you why Sunny Lands. <clears throat> right? So we have 
uh, Reagan, Eisenhower, we have Nixon, and we have Kissinger. Okay, these people go to sunny lands. So, of course, if you're going to have a big meeting, why not do it there, right? And so we have this sort of thing coming from uh, Time magazine. Well, now let's take a quick look at what journalists said, or at least how art directors and others represented it. So they have a meeting, June 7th, June 8th. And so we look at some newspapers. The LA Times, this is almost a local story. Actually, the Desert Sun, it was a local story, and they devoted huge resources to it. And I have to say, they did as good, if not better, a job than many national publications. I was really quite impressed with the reporter who was one of the lead on this. But the LA Times, of course, the big story that broke out that Friday was the terrible shooting uh, that involved uh, a, a fellow in Santa Monica who killed a number of people. Right? Of course, that got a lot of attention. But the LA Times features it, and they're, of course, having a good time with uh, things heating up uh, out in the, the burning desert. Uh, so we have this. But what's this? Newsday. Where is the Sunnylands report? It's not there. The emphasis instead is on Snowden and that story. Well, if we look at other national newspapers, the Washington Post, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Sunnylands. The meeting is front and center. Emphasis on it. Because these papers have millions of readers all across the country. And what is more important than the U.S.-China relationship? And what basketball player, of course, is marrying what Hollywood star? These are the salient things. But even the Washington Post, perhaps upset that the meeting isn't happening in Washington, <laughs> doesn't devote an article to it, but says, on an inner page, we'll get to that thing happening out in California. And before that, we're going to focus on, uh, in this case, the Connecticut shooting. But let's go around the country a little bit. So Detroit. <coughs> Sunnylands. Sunnylands. Not in Detroit. Now, this is striking because General Motors sells more cars now in China than it does in the United States. But perhaps the editors have judged that readers in Detroit are not so interested. Atlanta Constitution. Look with me. Is it there? No. Well, certainly in Chicago, certainly Chicago, right? Our nation's third largest city, uh, where the former mayor emphasized the teaching of China in teaching about a teaching of Chinese language in Chicago public schools, they must have something. No. Not on the front page. What is this saying about editorial decisions about what you and I in these places are interested in? Dallas Morning News, you've got the scenario by now. San Francisco, well, San Francisco, of course, San Francisco will talk about sunny lands. Not that day. How is this? How is this? Local considerations. Editors deciding what will move somebody to read this newspaper, to pick it up. Well, Jeff mentioned uh, some news magazines. And, of course, we have the Brokeback Mountain uh, uh, version, the effort to build a bromance out there. Um, I would have lied. I, th I think if they had just shown up in jeans and heavy coats, it would have been really <laughs> fascinating. But in any case, so they are going in a rather playful way. And The Economist has been doing this kind of thing for some time and recently, of course, had Xi Jinping dressed as the Qianlong Emperor. 
uh, on its cover. So other kinds of things. Well, how about Bloomberg Business Week? Bloomberg, this giant American news organization, they, of course, are going to focus on the U.S.-China relationship because look how much business is being done. Not this week. Abe Economics, their focus is on the Japanese prime minister's attempt to reform that economy. But Time Magazine, Time Magazine devotes an issue, or a cover story at least, to the world according to China. And they've come up with this very creative cover design by somebody who probably isn't going to be mentioned in the Chinese press. Ai Weiwei. <laughs> And, but it looks like a traditional paper cut, right? So time is paying attention. Now, Jeff Baum, uh, I spent quite a lot of time with Jeff out in, out, out in uh, Rancho Mirage and at this event. And at one point to me, he said, the Chinese stay on message. The Chinese stay on message. And of course, that's absolutely correct. Because you have somebody dictating a message, and you have a propaganda authority that ensures that message be put out. So let's take a look. Here's People's Daily. Here's People's Daily. Study it carefully. Those, many of you can read Chinese, but those who can't, study it carefully. There is going to be a test. Here's the test. This is Guangming Rabao. So this newspaper used to be called the, new, the Intellectuals newspaper. Uh, back in the 1980s, they referred to that. What's different? Even if you can't read Chinese, you will see the similarities. And what's different is the font. <laughs> and the inclusion, you know, in a couple of instances, of subtitles. Staying on message. Local at the Guanmin Rabao, this is the national newspaper, doesn't need to think very much, right? The person who does the heavy lifting already did it. And then we have Beijing Rabao, Beijing Daily, and yes, a different font. <laughs> but the story, very much the same. And let's take a look at a couple of the stories. So one of the things that I'd like to draw your attention to is this article up here. And the Chinese readers have already spotted that here they mention Madame Peng. That Peng Liyuan is coming with Xi Jinping back to, uh, is, I'm sorry, is here on the way to go see the American President Obama. In the past, whoever the spouse is doesn't get mentioned. Hu Jintao came to the United States in January of 2011. He is married. His wife has shown up at things, but not then. Not then. And as near as I can tell, nobody went on Twitter to complain about the snub. Because Americans didn't see it that way. So that's one part. The other part is, of course, the emphasis here on this meeting between the two leaders. And the effort to create what? Foster peace, cooperation across the Pacific. That sort of thing. So here is the focus. Here is the focus. Now there is some variation. There are local newspapers that don't exactly duplicate the People's Daily. But there are instructions. And so, unless you are a sports magazine, you better have the country's leader on the cover, on the front. And so here we have some variation, uh, but you'll see similar sorts of placement and pictures, right? Now I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Arky Lee, to talk about what she found on Weibo. Thank you. So uh, I have a question for every Chinese student here.
Before this summit, do you know that this Annenberg is the same as that Annenberg at Sunnylands? So, <laughs> yeah, I believe so. And before this summit, even the translation of the Annenberg is like different across the internet. You can see a lot, and if you still remember the last slide we show, that even the Chengdu Embassy did the other one. They saw Annenberg instead of Annenberg. And um, but nowadays, like uh, this name, it's kind of like settled on that, and there is the official translation, and it is also on the website of the Edinburgh, uh the official website. And but now we mention that we also mention this is a place where the leaders of these two countries meet. And so. Uh, we're talking about the Weibo. Weibo is some place that where people in China think that they can speak freely, even though sometimes there are limits there. But you can see that it's kind of like different from the normal newspapers. People give out their uh, what they're really thinking about the meeting. They're thinking about uh, what do they eat, what do they wear, and what will the First ladies be looking like, and how will they greeting each other, and will there be hugs or kisses or anything else? Yeah, they're kind of like curious about that. And so after the meeting, like uh, two days after the meeting, the first day, uh, there is post about who the chef is, uh, what kind of things they eat, and very glorious word about. Uh, the lobsters, uh, steaks, the uh, cherry pie, and uh, the golden, and sh I, I, I believe they almost mentioned a chandelier above them. <laughs> and also, uh, they're kind of like disappointed with something that the other first lady didn't show up. Because according to the chi m many Chinese, uh, they think that it is on one hand, uh, kind of like a political interaction, but on the other hand, kind of like a beauty pageant. Like, we got a very fabulous first lady, finally, and <laughs> we want to show off. She's on a show party, kind of. Um, but Michelle is not here, so they kind of like disappointed, and everybody's guess what happened, what happened, and either kind of like this respect from the uh, Michelle side, or just the American tradition, you have to go to the graduation uh, ceremony and stay with your kids. So people are guessing. And this is only a one very uh, neutral post online. There are a lot of other things which are not so pleasant on the eyes, so I didn't post them here. But um, the, the one thing that is consistent among the, those posts is that people think, the Chinese people think, that Michelle should, should have shown up in this summit. Because this summit is about something Carol, something the two leaders can work out some chemistry between them. And why not the first ladies? It's just something like the, we say, as ice on the cake, right? Um, so, so we're back to the meeting. When we say it's a meeting, it's about more uh, personal relations instead of uh, international relations. So when people say there isn't like very concrete things, very substantial, like agreements came out from this meeting, I am not surprised. And I don't think there are people that are very surprised on Weibo either. And so these are the uh, people retweet the more official coverage about the outcomes of this meeting. And even before this summit, there, are, there were already people predict that there won't be any concrete things coming out from this meeting. And it turns out they were right. Um, so this is about the a January talk, and they almost mentioned everything. And people are very interested in seeing how Japan reacts from that. And they picture uh, Abby kind of like a Judas little, um, little, yeah, mistress who was 
not feeling very well about uh, Obama meeting Xi Jinping for two days, and he only met him for uh, 90 minutes. So, and Obama even canceled the meeting with uh, Ambe in the G8 summit. So this is something that the Chinese were talking about on Weibo. And yeah, so we see the meeting is a political thing, but on the other side, it is a, also a commercial publicity thing. So if we see any every post about the Annenberg and Sunnylands, we only see the good things. There's no negative things. Say this is a like lovely place or some something bad about that. No, nothing about that. People always say, well, if I got money, I would go there. Or, um, yeah, they, they predict that these summit will, all, will also drive, uh, fuel Chinese tourism. And, um, yeah, and the, the travel agencies, yeah, it's very typical Chinese things. You got a meeting, and the travel agencies got the posters the other day. It is, yeah. Just you can imagine, maybe probably the next year or the next next year, when people go to the embassies to get a visa, probably they want to say, "Oh, our president went there, and so I want to went there, and here I am to get my visa." Okay, and here is the Weibo thing. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, what Arky has to say about the tourism, of course, is big because this was you know was huge, and in fact, I visited the outlet malls. Uh, to ask if they were doing these sorts of things. And it's remarkable how little has actually been done. One of the outlet mall owners has a Chinese page, but they're not, for example, blanketing with advertisements. Uh, in the food court, they say, we can take your Chinese credit card as well as an American one, that sort of thing. But that's about it. Uh, they're having tried. Those of you who are looking for jobs, uh, you can get a job out there. If you speak Chinese, you get a couple bucks more an hour. But they can't <laughs> hold on to anybody because other better opportunities come along right away. Uh, so here is the Global Times. Uh, one affiliated with the Chinese Communist Party, and they did a poll right afterwards and concluded that uh, most, in both Americans and Chinese, are friendly. Very few Americans and Chinese see each other as allies, but they're generally friendly. Uh, and then here, a significant number of Americans, almost 15%, uh, felt that China could be conceived of as an enemy. Well, what about the protesters? We'll run through these very quick because we want to get to your questions. On the way out there, the, the first sight for me was these guys driving very slowly, backing up traffic for miles because they were hauling a 400-pound statue of the Buddha in the back of a truck. And they weren't really, they were holding onto it. I was terrified that somebody was going to fall out. This was the Free Tibet, the pro-Tibet protesting group. And they had to carry this because... Uh, of security around sunny lands, they had to carry this thing about two miles to get it so that it was opposite. And of course, Xi Jinping drove in a different entrance. So, you know, you do what you can. Anyway, that night, uh, it's still well over 100 degrees, and I'm out amongst the protesters. And one of the things that was new to me, because uh, going to some of these kinds of things, uh, were accustomed to protests of various sorts. But you had a Vietnamese contingent that was very well represented. And they've got this uh, map of Vietnam and two islands that the Vietnamese would like to hold on to, okay, would like to get. And so the Vietnamese were there. And, of course, there were also Falun Gong protesters and others. You had pro-China protesters or supporters, I guess, and this is, a, this is in Indian Wells across from the hotel where Xi Jinping stayed. And people were out here. It was, oh, it was balmy. It was about 104. And so we're all lined up. And people, everybody's pretty peaceful talking to each other. And the Palm Springs folks, had, uh, the Riverside uh, County security folks had done a great job. They had portal, portable toilets and all kinds of things like this. Uh, but what happened was they got somehow a notice that Xi Jinping was going to leave. And so they came out and formed this line opposite the protesters. Before that, the protesters are chatting amiably, disagreeing about everything, but chatting amiably. 
you know, figuring out which, had the, which, which restaurant for Chinese food was the best, these kinds of things. The line came out, and tensions rose, and people started fighting for positions, and you had boom boxes come out with the Chinese national anthem and things like that. And I felt sorry for these folks, these riot, folks in riot gear, because it was so hot, and they had to stand out there for about 45 minutes before she actually emerged. Well, what did they talk about? We know they talked about several important issues, but cybersecurity was very much on the, on the docket. And this is the press availability that they had <coughs> on the 8th. And uh, you know, they, were late. they also had dinner together and this sort of thing. But Obama says, uncharted waters. Okay, and this is all in this context, right, of... Uh, these sorts of things. And Xi Jinping says, yes, we can cooperate on cybersecurity because we're victimized too. Now, that's a very different position than taken by the United States. This is Tom Donilon, who did a press briefing afterwards. He's, he was, at that time, the national security advisor for President Obama. And he wanted to emphasize not cybercrime, of a traditional sort, stealing your credit card number, but the stealing of intellectual property. And it's been described as this huge theft. And so he emphasized that. Well, let's quickly look at television coverage in the United States. Not much. ABC News did a really horrible job on the Peng Li Yuan story. Uh, they, they got everything wrong on this. Uh, it was really quite, quite surprising. Uh, ABC This Week, the Sunday talk program, <coughs> didn't mention the summit at all. The emphasis was entirely on Snowden. But there's Meet the Press, right? Well, as it happens, not this week, uh, because they had the French Open. <laughs> okay. How about Fox News? How about Fox News? No. Not one word, not one word about the meeting. State of the nation from CNN. No, no, no mention at all. Face the nation was the only of the major chat programs, Sunday chat programs, that spent time on it. They had a panel of four people, including Joseph Nye, who you already saw. This is when he made this statement. But also these newspaper and television correspondents. And this is Margaret Brennan here. She was saying, the American message was the same one. We don't have to fight. We don't have to fight. And she says, maybe this time people took that comment seriously. The BBC did a much better job, a much better job. <laughs> yeah, I heard people say, of course, right? But in any case, the BBC focused on this. Now, Jeff Cowan said, we'd like to avoid conflict. And that's what is highlighted here by the BBC correspondent, which spent a lot of time on this. Al Jazeera did a better job. Al Jazeera was more comprehensive in its coverage, both of the event and of the protests. CCTV. Nobody in this room should be surprised that CCTV went for this in a big way. Okay? You know, all sorts of resources devoted to it. This is the CCTV website devoted to Xi Jinping coming out to the desert, right? And you have all sorts of things. Now, the emphasis at this meeting in case you didn't get the talking points, we'll come back to those in just a second, uh, CCTV actually did a story when Sunnylands came up with a Chinese website. Imagine. How many times have you seen CBS do a story about a Chinese company or a Chinese site having a site in English? But CCTV was focused on this Okay, focusing on a Chinese web page for visitors. Wait, we're almost yes. Out of time. Okay. Uh, very quickly, they CCTV tried to spark, <laughs> tried to spark discussion. Nobody discussed this on the CCTV website. 
uh, where they were trying to talk. What, what is he going to eat out there in California? So you stop at a taco stand? Uh, what's going to happen, you know, in talking about this sort of thing? Well, here what, here's what the point. Here's the point. The United States and China have to come up with a new relationship that doesn't involve going to war, that doesn't involve conflict. That's the emphasis. That's the emphasis. The American emphasis was more like this. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll stop with that so that you folks have a chance to raise questions of your own. Well, and they won't have much because, unfortunately, we, we promise people that we end by one. Thank you, Clay, for a terrific presentation. <laughs> by the way, what was the date on that the Bloomberg thing? This is Feb Bloomberg was February, so, so that's the context. Really, yeah, so just so you know, that was yeah. not a, a cover that came backward. I just thought people might be interested to know the two things that have come out of this now from a sunny lens standpoint, and it's a national perspective, too. Uh, first of all, because this meeting took place at Sunnylands, this summit, which was so favorably treated uh, in the American media, but especially the Chinese media, we have the potential at Sunnylands to have other extremely important U.S.-Chinese meetings. And there are a number of them that are being cooked up now. So three or four very high-level meetings between the United States and, and, the, and the Chinese that, that will probably be small retreats that take place at Sunnylands and in the desert. The second thing is, in terms of tourism, since you're wondering, <laughs> not only do we have a web page in, in Mandarin, but we also have now uh, have trained a whole new group of guides to give tours about, uh, uh, that are about the Chinese history of Sunnylands, of which there's much, and Chinese art and so forth, but also about this tour. And Clay, you probably know this, but a number of our tour guides this year will be giving guide, tours in Mandarin. So we have... Despite what's happening in the outlet malls, we really are doing this, and we expect to have quite a few tourism, tourists, but stay tuned. So maybe we could, during the next uh, five or six minutes, get comments, especially, I'd love it, from Chinese P, uh, students who are, who are uh, at USC who'd like to either make a comment or ask a question about this. Could I encourage some of the Chinese <coughs> students here to get Yeah, please. Hi. I'm a uh, translated Chinese international student, major in international relations concentrates on the relationship between the U.S. and China. So I see in this presentation, you see, you show a lot of differences in American, Chinese media and American media and how media plays, or what kind of role that media plays in a political relationship and economic relationship between these two countries. So I have a question. So my, your personal opinion on this is like, so what do you think that what the media in both countries can do in order to benefit the, relationship, the political relationship between these two countries? Clay, do you want to come up? Uh, well, the, the first thing the media can do is pay attention. I think that's the number one complaint from those of us who focus on China is that there isn't greater attention. And so, for example, there's this focus on problems in the relationship. But the two leaders met for a single reason, to send a message to each other that they want better relations and to send a message to their peoples, that same message, that we can find ways to work things out, even though we disagree on important issues in big ways. And so they're sending a message there. But in terms of what the media can do, the media could, for example, report on this tourism, on a lot of other things that are going on. You had, for example, council people at Rancho Mirage who are talking to similar level people in Chinese cities about shared issues. What, for example, matters in Rancho Mirage? Among other things, of course, urban planning, but also aging. And these are issues in China as well. And so the media could pay attention to the great range of things that involve peoples on both sides. Let's get one or two more. Yes, in back. Yeah, my name's Corinna. I'm a new grad from the Journal. Can you stand up so you can hear the letter? My name's Corinna, and I just graduated from the Journal Business School. So I'm going to ask you a question. So I like the presentation of Mandarin. Yeah. Um, and I just want to mention one thing that when we were talking about the Chinese um, social media's reaction to this meeting, there were actually a lot of entertainment elements in it, too. And I wish that part could be included. 
But I noticed that we looked at the social media in China, mainstream media in China, and also mainstream media here. But we don't have, we don't, we didn't look into the social media here. Sure. I wonder what does that imply? Does it mean that the Chinese common people are more interested in this meeting than the American normal people? Or I'm just wondering. It means actually that Clay Doobie's team and Archie were more aggressive <laughs> than the rest of us. And we, and we should have done it more. Rachel, you, did you look at Facebook and American media too, or were you just looking at the Chinese media? It, it's a failing on our part, I think, not to have studied it. And I don't know if it could still be studied. We should. That's well, I would just say yeah, we definitely could study it. But I think, Karina, that you're absolutely right. Chinese people paid more attention. Yeah, okay. And so I think, that, I think that that's definitely the case. Uh, and, for example, the focus on Peng Liyuan, and the difficulty in trying to convince Chinese journalists that this was not a snub, uh, trying to explain that sort of thing. They said, well, but she came thousands of miles to the United States. How could you not go? And then trying to frame it in being a responsible parent and caring for your kid who's graduating from school, that kind of thing, still didn't work. Guests from afar are supposed to be treated better. We did, we did look at what tw was on Twitter, harder yeah. to look at some of the other ones. And uh, <clears throat> one thing that happened is it became a little bit of a political fo fo yeah. football. So Laura Ingraham, for example, will not shock you to know, <laughs> tweeted what a terrible idea it was to have this meeting. Um, to, can we get just one more Chinese uh, student to comment uh, back? Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Isabel and I'm the director of uh, uh, Chinese Standards and Standards. I have a question about the Chinese media and how they are treating uh, US education to uh, Chinese students. As you know, like many Chinese, Chinese students come to the U.S. and the U.S. government policy is really now is really welcomed by many mm -hmm. change of visa policy. But uh, it's it's very possible that in future the future leadership will come out of the, now the Chinese, Chinese students here in the United States. Do you think besides the money reason, there is a reason that um, the United States would like to educate them? So in the future they will have more idea of democracy and uh, uh, other idea more like. I'm going to answer that for a second because uh, I think that there are many of us who believe, and this includes Dean Wilson and Jay Wong, people involved in public diplomacy, but also true of the U.S. State Department, have long believed that educating uh, people not just from China, but from every part of the world in the United States and having American students studying around the world is good for many reasons, ranging from world peace to world trade. And I think that the increase in Chinese students in the United States is a very good thing. And I think there's an effort to increase the number of American students mm -hmm. who study in China. I think we can all do a better job, though, of making sure that the experience that the Chinese students have in America is both better for those students and also uh, better for uh, American students and other international students who have the privilege of being in school with them. We were in the room with them today. You were in the room with others today. Uh, and so I would just like to thank, um, uh, I, er, you think Ernie has a, do you have a concluding remark you want to make? Yes. Okay, make a concluding <laughs> remark. <then. laughs> thank you all so much for coming in. Thank you for the show, Clay and Archie. Thank you so much. Thanks.